Hi friends, so today I'm beginning lecture 23 of our helicopter dynamics course and we are going to discuss the mode shapes of non-rotating beams. I'm Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now let's review the partial differential equation of the rotating beam which we know we cannot solve and therefore we were working on the uniform non-rotating beam equation given here. Now we solved this equation in our previous lecture and we obtained the solution WR in terms of the hyperbolic sine and cosine and the sine and cosine function. Then we enforced the boundary conditions for the cantilever beam and we found that to obtain a non-trivial solution you need to get the determinant of this matrix here this 4 by 4 matrix to 0. And when we enforce that condition, we got this transcendental equation cos lambda r, cos h lambda r equal to minus 1, which you can solve using any numerical methods. And there are an infinite number of solutions of this particular equation, which will give you the lambda r values. The lambda r values are given here. And once we have obtained lambda r, we can use the fact that lambda is related to m, rotation or natural frequency square, and ei. And therefore, this equation here gives you the natural frequencies of the cantilever beam once you know all the lambda r's. And essentially, there are an infinite number of frequencies because it is an infinite degree of freedom continuous system. Now we are going to turn our attention to the mode shapes. So as we have discussed before for discrete systems, if we are trying to obtain mode shapes, then we have to look at these constants and we have to set one of these constant to some number. So let's set f equal to negative one. And if we do that, we can take the first three equations and we can solve these equations or we can write this system here so for example the first equation would become d plus f equals zero so here that becomes d and because f is minus one we get the one on the right hand side similarly the next equation would become c plus E is 0. So that's this equation here. And the third equation becomes sine h lambda r into c plus cos h lambda r into d minus sine lambda r into e plus cos lambda r equal to 0. So that goes here and becomes minus cos lambda r. So once we have obtained this solution here, we are going to move down further and get all these values. So before that, we'll just make some generic statement that mode shapes corresponding to a particular frequency are obtained by substituting lambda r in any three equations. So we have taken the first three equations here and got this equation here. Now from this equation, we can calculate WR because now we know all these coefficients. We have set F is minus one. And if you look carefully at these three equations, you see the first equation tells you that D equals one. The second equation tells you that C plus E equals zero or C is minus E. And the third equation then tells you sine H lambda R C plus cos h lambda r d minus sine lambda r e is minus cos lambda r. So solving all these equations, we can express all these equations in term of just one variable. So we could express all these equations, for example, in terms of c, and then we can obtain this as the mode shape. So you clearly see here that this part of the mode shape depends on lambda capital R which of course is known given the 
particular mode shape is known and these parts are dependent on small r which is essentially the radial location of the point so for each lambda r value which we have in our solution we have the mode shape so for each frequency we have a specific mode shape now these natural mode shapes represent unique ways in which the beam vibrates when it is perturbed or excited so for example if an impulsive force is applied at the tip so you hit the cantilever beam with a hammer at the tip for example all the modes will get perturbed or excited now what happens is that typically most of the response contribution comes from the first three to four modes and therefore we get a key simplification in most structural dynamics problems in that only the first few modes need to be considered for obtaining the response of the system so let's look at the first few modes of a cantilever beam so you have the cantilever beam here it's fixed at one end free at the other so the first mode corresponding to this frequency here is something like this now you can clearly see here in the shape that the boundary condition is satisfied here that is w is zero here and w dash is zero so essentially the mode shapes will always satisfy the boundary conditions in the second case we have this here the third case we have this and so on now the mode shapes of the cantilever beam are used in many places in dynamics and these are known as beam functions so essentially we can write these beam functions out like this where we have used the more general term x here which is widely used in the beam literature instead of the r and again each of these mode shapes corresponds to the particular natural frequency concern and for each of these uh, natural frequencies we can actually find out the value of alpha which comes in here remember this is the term dependent on the lambda capital r and then the remaining terms are actually the ones which are dependent on x and so these are the ones which essentially dictate your radial location along the blade now why are beam functions useful is they have certain good properties which we know mode shapes typically have so they are orthogonal so for example we see here that the integral 0 to r m phi i phi j is 0 when i is not equal to j and when it is when i is j it's going to be m i so in general we can represent this with the chronic or delta we have discussed before similarly we can get this expression here in terms of the flexural stiffness part of the the equation so these essentially will lead to matrices which get diagonalized and that is something which happens when you typically use these normal modes or beam functions so here m i is the generalized mass given as 0 to r m phi i square dr now beam functions are enormously important for calculating approximate solutions for the rotating beam because they satisfy the boundary conditions now why do we need approximate solutions of the rotating beam we saw we cannot solve the partial differential equation for natural frequencies but there are methods such as the Galerkin method, Rayleigh Ritz method, and so on, where we can presume a solution in terms of certain basis functions. And beam functions make very good basis functions for those kind of problems. So we also can use beam functions when we are doing response solutions. And this is often used in the Galerkin or Rayleigh Ritz method for such problems. So not only these beam functions are used in the rotor dynamics, but also in wing dynamics. So for example, if you are dealing with any wing of a fixed wing aircraft, it can be represented as a cantilever beam. And therefore you can use the beam functions because these will satisfy the boundary conditions for the problem. Now, you know from mathematics that orthogonality leads to basis functions having good convergence characteristic and if you think about it philosophically that is why uh, 
the Fourier series works very well because again, sine and cosine functions have similar properties. But here, the advantage of these particular functions is they also satisfy the boundary conditions. So that makes them very useful. So now let us go back to our partial differential equation for rotating beam vibration and we try to enforce the simple harmonic motion concept here. So essentially we say WRT is capital WRE to the power I natural frequency into time and we substitute this back into the PDE. So of course the result is the time variable is removed out from this equation but this equation still remains extremely difficult, if not impossible to solve because of the presence of this integral term. And like I've mentioned before, you can solve it for certain special cases in terms of hypergeometric function. There is a paper by Storty on that and some more papers are there on this particular aspect, but these functions are again quite complicated. So there is no simple solution to this problem. So this particular equation has no simple solution. If you find a solution, then please be ready to write a paper on this because it would be a very useful discovery. Now, typically we often work in non-dimensional notation when we work on helicopter dynamics. So this equation is often written in a non-dimensional form. So just to introduce you to this non-dimensional concept, we define M0 as some reference mass per unit length. So this could be based on some uniform blade, which could be there. And then we describe certain non-dimensional nomenclature. So we describe, we non-dimensionalize R by capital R, the blade radius, and we non-dimensionalize the displacement by R. And then we can write the governing equation in this particular form where we have a non-dimensional stiffness here, and we obtain the non-dimensional flap bending frequencies. Now, very often these non-dimensional quantities are used when we write computer programs to calculate frequencies and so on, because one of the advantages is that the use of very large numbers, which may be possible if you were to use just EI, is mitigated by the use of non-dimensional quantities. And one of the advantages of doing that is that various computer errors which come in because of round off are mitigated to a large extent. So mostly when you do computer programming and you try to find the frequencies, response and stability of any system, you try to create some non-dimensional values which is used by the code. And then later you can of course convert these to dimensional values. The other advantage is that you can easily compare non-dimensional values across different rotor blades and therefore get a feel for the problem because each of the absolute values may be very different, but there are certain patterns which are revealed in terms of the non-dimensional values. So we have seen that, for example, in the non-dimensional flap frequency, we know that this number is going to be somewhere between 1.03 to 1.12 per rev. And so this is generally true for most helicopter rotors, but the dimensional values would be very different depending on the particular problem concerned. They would be expressed in radian per second or hertz. So that ends today's lecture. I will see you in my next video where we are going to look at the Galerkin method, which is the first of a series of method we are going to use to try to find the natural frequencies of the rotating beam. See you then.